Hey Jackets fans, welcome to Boom and Gloom, where we talk about the good, the boom, and the bad, the gloom, of Columbus Blue Jackets hockey. And let's face it, with this team, it's been mostly gloom over the years. Well aware of that. I'm your host, Anthony, also known as Whaler Jacket on social media platforms, and I am Ohio's longest suffering hockey fan. You can take a listen to some of my earlier episodes if you are new here and wondering why I call myself that, but it is something something I truly believe and I feel I have legitimate reasons to back it up. So uh, let's get started today. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start you off with a little TMI moment, something you definitely don't need to know, but I'm going to say it anyway. I had a colonoscopy this morning, my first one ever. So the last couple of days have not been pleasant for me. But then, I got some incredible news that has definitely perked me up. I'm not going to hide my excitement for this one. The Columbus Blue Jackets have hired a coach. Finally. Finally they've hired a coach. And that coach is none other than Dean Evason. I am truly pumped about this. And I'll be honest, it is difficult for me to to give you an unbiased opinion about the hire because I really believe I am Dean Evason's biggest fan, not as a coach, as a player. Uh, growing up, I was a fan of the Hartford Whalers, and it is amazing how similar they are to uh, the Columbus Blue Jackets. Throughout their, their existence, their entire existence, the Hartford Whalers advanced past the first round of the playoffs only once. Sound familiar? They were also a small market team. Uh, they often didn't get the respect or the attention they deserved, at least in my opinion, especially when they were so close geographically to uh, teams like, you know, teams in Boston and New York. You know, they were they were overshadowed by the uh, success and the fanfare of the Bruins, the Rangers, and even the Islanders. The Whalers, with their lack of success, they didn't uh, they didn't get m- much or as much media attention as those other teams. I mean, heck, even the the Celtics and the Knicks got more attention during hockey season than the Whalers did in Connecticut. But I was a fan of those lovable losers growing up, and my first favorite player was a dude named Paul Lawless. And I'll never forget, he wore number 28 for the Whale. He had uh, long, dark hair sticking out the back of his helmet. And as an impressionable kid, I just thought he was so cool. But as I learned, I learned more about the game of hockey you know, more and more, I was able to really pay attention to how it was played, like, and, you know, really understood the game, and that's when another player stood out to me, number 12 for the Whalers, Dean Evason, and I loved his style, I could relate to him, okay, he was, he was undersized, just like me, Uh, I I think he was like 5'9 or 5'10, so not, not super undersized, but definitely not a big dude. And me being 5'7", that didn't seem much taller than me. But you know what? He didn't play like a, a smaller dude. He played with heart and passion. And he was never a prolific scorer. He broke the 20-goal plateau twice in his career, I believe. But he was never afraid to mix it up. He was never afraid to, to dig the puck out of the corners and, and take a beating. And I, and I related to that. I mean, that, that's how I play the game of hockey. I never scored many goals. I think I, had, I think I had five total in my high school career. But I played with heart and with passion. And I got my butt kicked a lot, you know, trying to dig pucks out of the corners or along the boards. And I wore number 12 on the back of my sweater 
just like Mr. Evison. I'll never forget going to the Hartford Civic Center, which was lovingly nicknamed The Mall. Went with my dad, and we were watching the Whalers play the Kings one year. I was also a Gretzky fan, so I was there to see my two favorite teams and my my two favorite players go at it. Um, Dean Evison scored the first goal of the game, and I remember cheering and, and hearing Brass Bonanza play and then telling my dad, okay, we can go home now. I was, of course, kidding, but, but I was just so happy to see my favorite player, who didn't score very often, score in person. And I had to be like like 12 or 13 years old, but I still remember that vividly. And now here I am, 47 years old, living in Ohio. And Dean Evason is once again part of my favorite team. Things have come full circle, I guess, and I, I couldn't be happier about this hire. So I'm going to do my best here to provide some insight without bias, as, as difficult as that might be. I've been seeing a lot of mixed reactions on social media about the hire, rightfully so. I don't think Evison was the team's first choice. I think it was Todd McClellan. Um, Evison has experience as a head coach, but not a lot. And without going back to check, I, I want to say he was only with Minnesota for like uh, a year and a half as their head coach. I've said it all along that I hope the Jackets would hire someone with head coaching experience, and they did. But not a lot. He does not have a lot of head coaching experience. I like to think that this is a good hire, though, for several reasons. And again, I'm trying to to overcome my bias and, and look at this objectively. I'll start off with what I think is the best reason. Dean Evison coached a team that had no business making the playoffs to a playoff berth in Minnesota. That says to me he is able to squeeze everything he can out of his players. That says to me that he can foster team unity. That says to me that his players respect him. And I also think he'll be able to preach two-way hockey. Just like in his playing days, he'll want his players to go into the danger zones and dig out the pucks. And I think he'll hold, I'll, he'll hold the players accountable, too. He seems... Um, I haven't seen him coach all that much. You know, I've seen clips, I've seen highlights. I've, you know, I watched, um, I watched him coach in person. Uh, uh, I went to a, a Jackets game at Nationwide Arena when they were playing the Wild, so I was able to to see him in person. So I, I can't say I have a lot of experience watching him, but from what I've seen, he seems emotional on the bench when he coaches, and I think that will play, play in well for a team that where the, the last few seasons there's been Pascal Vincent and Brad Larson who were, were lacking that. They, they lack that, that, uh, that fire as a coach. So I think this will benefit the Jackets greatly. So now I'm going to play devil's advocate. My biggest concern with Evison is can he develop our young players? Like, can he develop our young core? With limited head coaching experience, I have my doubts about that. The Jackets have some really, really good young talent. Is Dean Evison going to be the one to unlock all that potential and start building this team into a perennial winner? That, unfortunately, is just something that it remains to be seen. And I'll have to kind of take the easy way out here and say, Time will tell. I just <laughs> I just can't believe I'm sitting here talking about Dean Evison right now. I, I would have never thought that sitting in Ohio in my late 40s, I would be doing a podcast uh, discussing this man as a coach of my favorite team. I just, I bet if I, I talked about him a few years ago, very few people around here would even know who I was talking about. It's just, 
It's just amazing to me. Also amazing is the number of coaches and uh, GMs that that came from those Hartford Whalers teams that Evison played for. Evison's teammates, let me list some of them for you. Ron Francis. He's a general manager of Seattle Kraken. Kevin Deneen. He did some assistant coaching in the NHL, I believe. Joel Quinville. Dave Tippett. Brad Shaw, remember him? John Anderson. All coaches or GMs with uh, with Ron Francis who once played on the same team on the Hartford Whalers with Dean Evison. I think that's kind of cool. And Ray Ferraro, by the way, became an announcer. He was a teammate of uh, Dean Evison as well in that Hartford Whaler hockey era. So like all Jackets fans, I really hope this hire works out. They really need this hire to work out. And you know what? They are due. They are due for a hire like this to work out. This team has had so much bad luck and has made so many bad decisions. It, it's just, it's time. It's, it's really time for them to finally buck that trend. But again, only time will tell. The only thing I can say is all you haters out there, and I've already read lots of negative comments on this hire. The only thing I can say to you is please give it time. Be excited for this new era of Columbus Blue Jackets hockey. And let's see what happens. We have a new GM. We have a new head coach. We have some new players. Let's see what happens. If Evison doesn't work out, I'll be the first to admit I was wrong. But until he shows that he was not the right choice, here's what I say we should do. I say, let's embrace this hiring. Welcome him to Columbus. Let's show him what an awesome fan base we are. And let's see what he can do for this team. The Dean Evison era begins. All right, on to other CBJ news. I have several other little nuggets to discuss. I have been waiting and waiting and waiting for the Jackets to hire a coach so that I can put out another episode. And and that just obviously took way longer than we all expected. I had lots of notes ready, but I kept telling myself, just hold off a little longer. They'll hire a new coach any day now, and then you can record a podcast episode. Well, here we are, three weeks later, and they finally, finally hired a coach. The last NHL team without a coach now has one. And now, I can finally ramble on and rant and rave about all the other Blue Jackets news that has occurred over the past three weeks. So, uh, before I go any further, I will tell you that, um, once again, I had a procedure this morning, so I might, I'm I'm still feeling kind of uh, a little bit out of it. So if my voice sounds a little different or if I don't have as much energy, that is why. Even though I am totally energized by this uh, Dean Evison hiring, I still don't quite feel like myself. And I'm recording this in my home office right now. My wife is in the room next next door watching a K-drama. So if you hear Korean voices in the background, that is why. I don't really have a podcasting studio or anything and just do this from my home office all right here we go pascal vincent pascal vincent was hired as the new coach for the ahl laval rocket and i'm just gonna assume i'm saying that right laval you know what i say you know good for him you know he he goes to to his hometown to become a coach and that has to be a great feeling for him. I know he he would probably prefer to be an NHL head coach right now. And I, and I know that he kind of got a raw deal here with the whole uh, Babcock fiasco and starting training camp, camp late. Or getting a late start, I should say, on training camp. But I'm happy for the guy. I'm happy he'll be coaching. I'm happy, I'm happy, I'm happy he'll be coaching somewhere 
he loves, like somewhere he loves to be. And I'm pretty confident he'll wind up back in the NHL as a head coach or at least an assistant coach someday. But for now, I wish him the best of luck in Laval, if I'm saying it correctly, and I hope he, uh, he has a lot of success there. A report came out of Nationwide Arena that Nationwide Arena is in need of major upgrades and repairs. And one of the items that they said they need to upgrade is the scoreboard. And I think that's pretty cool. I have no issues with the arena's current scoreboard. And I'm, I'm not going to lie to you guys. I don't get to go to Blue Jackets games in person very often. One or two a year. Uh, do do travel time and cost. But when I do go, I... I have no problems with the current scoreboard, but if they're going to upgrade it to make it something even better, then I'm all for it. But make those repairs because you know what? You walk into Nationwide Arena and you never get the feeling that it's a 25-year-old barn. It has held up amazingly well with the times. If someone were to build an exact replica of Nationwide Arena in a different city, it would not look out of place or, you know, out, you know, out of place with modern times. It would look like it fits in. So whoever is responsible for that, architects, engineers, whatever, they deserve some kudos. The arena is just amazing. The arena district is amazing and it continues to evolve and grow, the arena, it, it just, it seems like it's really withstood the test of time so far. And I'd like to think that if someone smarter than me says it needs repairs, then take care of those repairs ASAP and keep it looking like a new building. Because to me, it still feels like a new building. So kudos to the grounds crew, the maintenance people as well. Like you will, you will not find many NHL arenas, if if any at all, that are nicer than Nationwide Arena. Adam Boquist signed with the Florida Panthers, the Stanley Cup champion Florida Panthers. I was still surprised he was bought out. I really thought that. I really thought that. If Don Waddell thought there were, you know, there was no place for him on the team, then a trade could have been made. I mean, obviously with Florida signing him, he he had some value. You know, he didn't have to go play overseas. An NHL team wanted him on his on the roster. So I was, you know, hoping they made a trade, but they didn't. They bought him out. And I guess I'm glad that there is another open spot now on defense because we do have some up-and-coming talent. I just wish... I wish we could have brought in someone other than Jack Johnson to take that spot, okay? Um, and I'll, I'll talk more about Jack, uh, Jack Johnson in just a moment, but I'm happy for Adam, okay? I'm happy for Adam, too. He, he's going to have a chance if he stays healthy to play for a Stanley Cup contender next year. And that is awesome for him. He was a very likable guy when he was here. Just couldn't seem to stay off that injured list. I hope I hope Bill Zito put into that contract that he was not allowed to wear the number 27. Or, I don't know, or is that just a curse for whoever wears, wears that number on the jackets? I don't know. Anyway, I wish him the best, and I feel... I feel like he'll he'll find some success on that team, on the Florida Panthers. Again, if he stays healthy. So how does this affect the Jackets? Bokvist would... Uh, I, I would see him as kind of like the, the second quarterback. The second power play quarterback behind Wierenski. And so now they lost that. So now we need someone to step up. So I'm thinking, who's gonna who's going to be that one to step up? Is it Severson? Is it Provorov? Is it Juracek? That's my question. Who is gonna step up 
to fill that that little void. And uh, thinking back to when uh, Boquist was injured, which was a lot, I can't remember who quarterbacked that second power play unit, so I'm not sure about that one. Now, speaking of Jack Johnson, I really want to be mad. I want to be mad about the Jackets picking him up. But I find myself fairly indifferent about it. He's not going to be playing first pair of minutes. He's not going to be, hopefully at least, if you know, I have my faith in D. Nevison now, he's not going to be overplayed, playing higher up in the lineup that he should. He's a likable guy. He loves Columbus and, and is excited to be back. So I can't be mad about it. And stupid question to go along with this. Does this mean that Kent Johnson has to put a K on the back of his jersey and be K Johnson? And then Jack Johnson has to put a J and be J Johnson? I wonder about the NHL rules about guys with the same last names that are on the same team. I remember a long, long time ago, probably late 80s maybe, when Ron and Rich Sutter played for the same team, and I can't even remember which one that was. St. Louis, maybe? I, I don't remember. And they put they actually put their full names on the back of their jerseys. You had Ron Sutter on the back and Rich Sutter on the back. Why couldn't they just put Sutter? I, it, it just looked really weird, and I always wondered why they did that. I mean, why couldn't they just put Sutter on both the jerseys? I mean, the numbers, I mean, their numbers are unique. So that's how you can tell them apart. I never felt like, I never felt any player needed to have that first initial added to the back of their jersey if they had another person with the same last name on their team. I mean, the number is what sets them apart from other players. So I wonder about that. So we'll see if if there's a K. Johnson and a J. Johnson jersey this year. And speaking of backs of jerseys, Sean Monahan is taking number 23. He'll be wearing 23 this year for the Blue Jackets. Jake Christensen wore it last season. So I wonder how that comes about. Did Monahan have to get permission? Like from Christensen? Did management just not even uh, worry about it and just say, yeah, you can have 23. Screw Christensen. Did Christensen just kind of offer it up? These things keep me up at night, people. These types of questions, okay? I don't know the answers to these questions, and I always wonder about it. And here's some some interesting trivia for you. More Blue Jackets have worn the number 23 than any other number in team history. Monaghan becomes the 15th player in club history to wear number 23, according to HockeyReference.com. And in case you were wondering... The second most is number 29. Twelve players have worn 29 in the history of the Blue Jackets. And third most is number 19. Eleven players have worn number 19 for the Jackets. Adam Fantilli, of course, changing his number to 19 this upcoming season. Other news. At this moment, this very moment of recording this podcast episode, Kirill Marchenko has not been signed. I know a lot of people are making a big deal about it on social media. I can't really comment on it too much because I really don't know the ins and outs of arbitration rulings. But I will say that I find myself not worrying too much about it. I'm not worrying too much about Marchenko. My money, if I was a betting man, my money would be on him uh, getting signed by the deadline. If not, He becomes the first Jackets player to ever go through arbitration, at least if if my memory serves me correct. I just hope his agent is not overvaluing him. I mean, he has had two low 20 goal seasons. I don't think he's broken the 25 mark, mark. I could be wrong on that. I wouldn't say having two low 20 goal seasons is earth shattering and deserving of a massive raise. Pay the man for sure, but be fair about it. Marchenko has not 
fully reached his potential yet. And there is never a guarantee that a player does. So I'm very eager to see what kind of contract he ends up signing. And then, of course, we still have uh, Cole Sillinger, Kent Johnson, who have yet to be signed. Now, Don Waddell took a huge step today by filling the head coach vacancy. Now, now he's got a few more important tasks at hand, and uh, he's got to take care of these contracts. And then there's Patrick Laine. We keep hearing that he's going to come out of the player assistant program any day now. But that's the thing. We just keep hearing that, and it never happens. The good news is that he was seen and, and filmed, like recorded, working out in Florida with some NFL players. So I want to say that's a good sign. I, I would say a very good sign, even. Some people are talking about how there's even a chance, albeit a slight one, that Line A starts the season with the Jackets, or even as a change of heart with uh, you know a new GM and a new coach in place. I guess that's possible, but uh, I would bet that Line A has a new home next season. That's just my my gut feeling on that one. And I can't I can't even speculate on what the return for Line A would be, you know, especially this far into the free agency period. But I would assume the Jackets are going to have to eat some of that huge salary. If not, okay, if Don Waddell can pull off a trade where where the Jackets do not eat any of Line A's salary, I want to buy Don Waddell a beer. But since he is rich and will probably never see me in person, I won't be able to buy him that beer. So I'll just buy someone else one. How's that? So if Waddell pulls off a hockey trade with no salary retained, find me at Nationwide. First person who does gets a beer on me. Lastly, there was recently a a projection done where um, you know someone used like data and analytics and all that fancy stuff to project team point totals for next season. In this projection, the Jackets were predicted to finish with 73 points, only ahead of Montreal and San Jose. So basically, it was saying that the Jackets would be the third worst team in the league next year. To put that in perspective, last season, the Jackets the Jackets had 66 points. Now, the projection had the Jackets at 73 points. So this is saying the Jackets will only get three more wins than last season and one additional overtime loss. You know, seven points, a difference of seven points. So they're predicted by this model to be seven points better than last season. I'm just going to come right out and say it. I'm a a pessimist by nature, and even I'm not buying that. I don't think the Jackets will make the playoffs, but I think we are going to see some marked improvement. More than three wins and an overtime loss, that's for sure. You know, and I I won't give you a, 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 a number I predict, but I will predict they will exceed... 73 points. When I look back at last year, all the injuries, all the the young players they have, uh, all the drama going into the season, a new coach, a new system, new players like uh, Severson trying to get accustomed to a brand new team in a brand new city. Then I look at this upcoming season. We have a, a new coach coach with a, a, I should say, a new experienced coach, a couple of new veteran players. You have the younger players who are now a season older, more experienced themselves. Fantilli returning from an injury, hopefully a fully recovered and motivated Kent Johnson. Voronkov getting more acclimated to the North American game. 
Chinny staying healthy. Johnny Gaudreau re- reunited with with someone he has known chemistry with. All that, I think we're going to see more improvement than just seven points. Okay, and that's really just a gut feeling at this point. But the Jackets went through a bunch of crap last year. They did. I mean, yeah, they were not very good. I, I get that. But they went through a lot of crap. And now, new coach, new GM, new environment, new culture. I think we're going to see a bigger change than, than what this model projects. And usually I am very negative, very much a pessimist. But I find myself being, being more optimistic about the Jackets' chances for marked improvement this season. So we'll see. This is what? This is episode 24 of this podcast. So towards the end of next season or or this season coming up, I'll look back at this episode and and we'll see. We'll see if I was right about that. But but I'm thinking they're 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 better than just three more wins. Okay? They they're, they're going to get more than they're going to increase their win total by more than just 3. So I think that's it. I think we are now caught up with Blue Jackets news. I don't put out many episodes during the summer, but all this news I figured it warranted one, and I figure once once the Marchenko contract situation is resolved, once uh, Kent and Cole are signed, and once the once Patrick Laine is either traded or a decision is made for him to stay in Columbus, at that point maybe I'll put out another episode to discuss. Until then, my friends, you can connect with me on Twitter. I am my my handle is Whaler Jacket. Always happen to happen always happy I told you I'm a little out of it guys always happy to talk jackets hockey with you and and get your thoughts on everything I just ranted about in this episode I'm signing off now I'm going to I'm going to go eat some more I'm not after after not eating anything solid from Saturday evening until today Monday I'm going to stuff my face tonight so we'll see everyone next time go jackets <laughs>